I've been doing a lot of reading about how humans perceive time, perceive speed, perceive velocity. Uh, and it's been observed that humans have no neurological organ framework that's dedicated to, to time and speed. It's a very awkward concept. And uh, I think about, um, there's been some research that uh, indicates that the, the Neolithic cave paintings in Europe were created during a time of artistic and cultural continuity that lasted 25,000 years. You know, 25,000, and we were talking about this at the DISH conference in, in, in Rotterdam a few years ago, uh, 25,000 years of continuous human continuity and culture. That's so different than what's happening now, today. So this idea of speed is, is hard um, and gets metaphysical very quickly. That being said, people who develop websites, who think on the web and work on the web, work with technology, have observed from in a practical term, practical tools, pen, pencil, that it's so much easier to get things done now than it was a few years ago. Um, back in the 90s when I was doing web stuff at the Asian Art Museums, we had an exhibition where we wanted visitors to share their tourist photographs of India online. This is back when AOL, America Online was big, people had dial-up modems, not a lot of people had digital cameras. I learned and wrote in Perl, basically Flickr, our own version of Flickr, a photo sharing website, because there really wasn't a Flickr, so we wrote it. Fast forward 10 years, 15 years, and the tools we have available to us, solid, for free, powerful, the user interfaces have gotten good, they're available in beautiful, simple interfaces on our, our mobile devices, that's real. Kevin Rose, the founder of uh, Dig, has said, um, you know, three or four years ago, five years ago, if you want, had an idea, it was hard. It was expensive. You probably needed an investors, you needed to rack servers, you needed to buy infrastructure, you needed to have programmers. Now you have an idea for a couple thousand dollars, you can see if it works, you can test it with real audiences. And the learning about it can accelerate, can take off immediately. And that's the, I think, being able to do things quickly is like compound interest. There's the apocryphal story that Albert Einstein was asked what the greatest invention of humankind was, and he said compound interest. Um, that story isn't real, but it demonstrates a true point. Um, thinking about that, the team we were talking about earlier that works in secret for two years, sure, great things can happen that way. But if they very early on produce a website, put their ideas on a wiki, build a community in days, not months or years, they can really begin learning and refining quickly. Um, that's the pattern I think will lead to better, more impactful work in museums. Not exclusively, but there's a lot of open territory to explore there. And we're not even talking yet about the real-time web, about um, social media, real-time social media's impact on society, on reporting, on people's expectations about how news is made and consumed and shared. Um, there's a lot of thinking that we need to do about how new ideas of speed at global scale impact knowledge creation, society, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Peter Schwartz from Global Business Networks, which is a, a consultancy and um, nonprofit strategy, came to work with the Smithsonian in uh, 2008 or so. And, and he observed that museums like universities were built on the model of enduring wisdom. You don't need to work fast. You don't need to change. You don't need to listen very carefully to the outside world on a daily basis, on a weekly, monthly basis, because you're, you're creating wisdom, knowledge, and knowledge endures. I thought that was a very powerful observation. 
and of course it's that there's an element to that that will always be true we will always need the scholar who goes up onto the mountaintop and thinks difficult thoughts for 10 years without interruption and comes back down with a new idea, a new concept, a breakthrough. There will always be a need in society for that kind of mind and that kind of innovation. But there's also so much value to be had in building a network of people with shared interests. So Chris Anderson of um, uh, Wired magazine and author of The Long Tail stood in front of a Smithsonian audience and said, um, pick any object from your collection, your 137 million object collection. The person in the world who knows the most about that object, not only do they not work for you, you don't even know who they are. You can't even find them. But if you put that object online, if you share what you know about it, if you share its digital surrogate openly so that it can spread, so that it can be reinterpreted and built upon, the people who know about that thing will find you and they'll find each other. So if our job as institutions in society is to have more knowledge created, the innovation word gets thrown around a lot. More innovation, more knowledge creation, more learning, more understanding. Where is that insight and innovation going to come from? Only from our experts or potentially from everyone else in the world? I think we can have both. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, we've made a series of bets in society over the last hundred years. Um, we, we've, we've halved global illiteracy. We've eliminated many diseases in the world. Um, we've changed the way we practice medicine, science. We've uh, opened up learning and education to millions of people. Um, you may have heard me talking about a Tom Friedman article that India has a new virtual middle class of people who are profoundly poor but who now have access to the internet in their homes. They can get the same services, the same information, the same information about government that their richer middle class countrymen have. That virtual middle class is 300 million people. This is profound in society. So the idea that our knowledge institutions will best serve society by just working quietly in isolation is an incomplete solution to the problem. The other day, uh, I was cleaning out old books from my house. My, my children are teenagers now and um, looking through their old children's books, the board books, those heavy cardboard books that, that early readers learn to work with. And, uh, I found a copy of The Tortoise and the Hare, which is known everywhere in, in the world, one of Aesop's fables about uh, an arrogant, fast rabbit who uh, challenges a slow but steady turtle, tortoise, to a race. And the moral of that is that slow and steady wins the race. And that's something that we, we teach our children. Uh, humility, steadiness, focus is the way to lead your life. Um, but it occurred to me that that equation only works if you know what race you're running in and if the finish line stays in one place. Um, if the finish line stays in one place. And that now, where carbon in the atmosphere is pushing 400 parts per million, um, Globalism is imposing pressures on society that we've never seen before. Um, in the United States, certainly, we're at a particularly difficult moment politically where we need all of the wisdom, all of the foresight we can muster, that the finish line is moving and it is racing away from us faster than we can run if we stick with only slow and steady. 
you were talking to me earlier about um, the connection between wisdom and knowledge and action. And I feel very strongly that now is a time for us to place some bets. The internet has been around for a while. We've seen a lot of things that work at scale, quickly, successfully, in harmony with our missions to the benefit of society. Now is the time to place the bets. 